contemplation is definitely a critical path and not just contemplation about spiritual aspects of our lives, but contemplation about erotic aspects of our lives, about political aspects of our lives. I'd also say it's solidarity as a spiritual practice and putting yourself in the, in the messiness of other people's needs and desire for self-governance and sovereignty. The very practice of living the post-capitalist values is itself an act, but that requires being a good student of your culture and spending some time educating yourself, ourselves, on what's happening in the world as like an ongoing praxis. Hello, welcome, and thank you for being part of The Future is Beautiful. This month in our membership Presence Collective, the theme is yoga and meditation. You will have access to a meditation course when you join, as well as our workshop on breath as life force. And you'll be able to join our two events this month, a workshop on mantra, the practice of sacred sound, and our presence circle where we share in community and dance. If you would like to find out how to become a member of Presence, please go to our website www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash courses. In case you haven't heard, my new book, Intuition, Access Your Inner Wisdom, Trust Your Instincts, Find Your Path, is available now as a hardback, Kindle and audiobook. Everyone that buys a copy can go to www.amisha.co.uk forward slash intuition and sign up for the beautiful gift package that I put together for you there with meditations, workshops, favorite practices, and more. Before we move into today's conversation, I want to read you these words by Clarissa Pincola Estes, which I mention in the conversation, in case you need to hear them today. We were made for these times. My friends, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I have heard so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world now. Ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradations of what matters most to civilized visionary people. You are right in your assessments, the lustra and hubris some have aspired to, while endorsing acts so heinous against children, elders, everyday people, the poor, the unguarded, the helpless is breathtaking. Yet I urge you, ask you, gentle you, to please not spend your spirit dry by bewailing these difficult times. Especially do not lose hope, most particularly because the fact is that we were made for these times. Yes, for years we have been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. I grew up on the Great Lakes and recognize a seaworthy vessel when I see one. Regarding awakened souls, there have never been more able vessels in the water than there are right now across the world. And they are fully provisioned and able to signal one another as never before in the history of humanity. Look out at the prow. There are millions of boats of righteous souls on the waters with you. Even though your veneers may shiver from every wave in this stormy royal, I assure you that the long timbers composing your prow and rudder come from a greater forest. That long grained lumber is known to withstand storms, to hold together, to hold its own, and to advance regardless. In any dark time, there is a tendency to veer towards fainting over how much is wrong or unmended in the world. Do not focus on that. There is a tendency too to fall into being weakened by dwelling on what is outside your reach, by what cannot yet be. Do not focus there. That is spending the wind without raising the sails. We are needed. That is all we can know. And though we meet resistance, we more so will meet great souls who will hail us, love us and guide us. And we will know them when they appear. Didn't you say you were a believer? 
Didn't you say you pledged to listen to a voice greater? Didn't you ask for grace? Don't you remember that to be in grace means to submit to the voice greater? Ours is not the task of fixing the entire world at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Any small, calm thing that one soul can do to help another soul to assist some portion of this poor, suffering world will help immensely. It is not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip toward an enduring good. What is needed for dramatic change is an accumulation of acts, adding, adding to, adding more, continuing. We know that it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small group who will not give up during the first, second or hundredth gale. One of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Soul on deck shines like gold in dark times. The light of the soul throws sparks, can send up flares, builds signal fires, causes proper matters to catch fire. To display the lantern of soul in shadowy times like these, to be fierce and to show mercy towards others, both are acts of immense bravery and greatest necessity. Struggling souls catch light from other souls who are fully lit and willing to show it. If you would help to calm the tumult, this is one of the strongest things you can do. There will always be times when you feel discouraged. I too have felt despair many times in my life, but I do not keep a chair for it. I will not entertain it. It is not allowed to eat from my plate. The reason is this. In my uttermost bones, I know something, as do you. It is that there can be no despair when you remember why you came to earth, who you serve, and who sent you here. The good words we say and the good deeds we do are not ours. They are the words and deeds of the one who brought us here. In that spirit, I hope you will write this on your wall. When a great ship is in harbour and moored, it is safe. There can be no doubt, but that is not what great ships are built for. These words are by the American poet, post-trauma specialist and Jungian psychoanalysis, who is also the author of the brilliant book, Women Who Run With The Wolves. That's Clarissa Pinkola Estes. My guest today is Alnor Ladda. Alnor's work focuses on the intersection of political organizing, systems thinking, structural change, and narrative work. He was the co-founder and executive director of The Rules, a global network of activists, organizers, designers, coders, researchers, writers, and others focused on changing the rules that create inequality, poverty, and climate change. The rule started in 2012 as a time-bound project and an experiment in anarchist organizational design, exploring new ways of how to work, play, and make trouble together. Al Noor comes from a Sufi lineage and writes about the crossroads of politics and spirituality in troubled times. He is a co-founder of Tierra Valiente, an alternative community and healing center in the jungle of northern Costa Rica. He is a board member of Culture Hack Labs and the Emergence Network. He holds an MSc in philosophy and public policy from the London School of Economics. This conversation explores the themes of post-capitalism, mystical anarchism, and solidarity. In this conversation called Entrusted with Everything, Entitled to Nothing, we contemplate the question, How can we recontextualize our relationships and interactions in a time of post-truth and late-stage capitalism? And as I sit here on the coast in Devon with very stormy seas, I hope that you enjoy this episode and that it brings some sense of navigation and purpose to your ship. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful, 
with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. It's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. This is the revolution. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. Al Noor, I am delighted to welcome you to The Future is Beautiful. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And I remember actually being with you in India not long after the podcast had started, you connecting me to my now dear brother, Manish Jain, as we were out in Oroville a few years ago. And wanting to speak to you for this podcast. And I love how, how these conversations always find their place later in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the, um, we were there for the 50th anniversary of Oroville at that moment. February 2018, I think. Yeah, about three years ago now. Yeah. What I know of where you're at at the moment is that you dissolved the rules and we're taking a sabbatical, although it's not an easy time to take a sabbatical with all of the events that have been happening over this past year for somebody that is interested in the things that you are interested in. And I would love for you to situate us with where you're at at this time. Physically, I'm, I'm in Costa Rica. I live in a community called Tierra Valiente which is a, you know, an attempt and experiment in, in post-capitalist living. We bought this land, uh, a group of about uh, 30 people, and put it into a trust. And so nobody owns it, and it's run as a co-op. And among the people who live here, there's no money exchanged. And yeah, for the external world that comes in and out, all those resources are brought back into the broader community. So that's where I'm physically at and kind of how I spend my time in, in the local biome here. And then where I am, I guess, kind of a dual question in some ways, right? And where I am kind of work-wise and energy-wise, life force-wise is um, I spend half my time about doing international solidarity work, um, supporting various social movements and largely peasant movements, farmer movements, indigenous movements, continuing on the, the work of the rules, but also doing just that through more of a, a, a personal capacity in, in supporting different movement leaders in the sort of spiritual, political nexus, uh, especially in this really confusing, crazy, intense time. And then I'm also doing some work with uh, a group called Culture Hack Labs, which is one of the spin-off organizations of The Rules and is a cooperatively run advisory group that does large-scale cultural interventions on sort of the acupuncture points, if you will, of, of the neoliberal system. From the position that you're in and the organizations and people that you're connected to, what you make of this moment that we are in. Yeah, it feels like we are in like a deep bifurcation, you know, extreme light, extreme dark, beautiful alternatives on one side and extreme psychosis on the other. And that polarization is getting deeper and more divided. And at the same time, we are being initiated as a culture into non-dualistic thought and into non-dualistic being, being able to hold multiple competing perspectives simultaneously and being comfortable with ambiguity and chaos and indeterminacy, almost in preparation for greater breakdown and tragedy and renewal and rebirth and so it's uh, multiple simultaneous realities, it feels like, uh, happening. And in some ways, I feel like the, the, the kind of two biggest thought forms, if you will, and by biggest, I mean, you know, the most reified, the strongest are uh, entitlement and victimhood. You know, and, and when I say thought forms, you know, I'm thinking in terms of 
almost like neoplatonic uh, mimetic uh, ideals so these memes are are like uh, the cultural equivalent of genes you know they're they're communicable you can catch them from one person to another they get transferred within cultures and societies they have their own biographies and they're self perpetuating and they they have their own will so you know you could see them as as deities almost as gods and the deities of entitlement and victimhood seem to be almost like uh, two heads of a hydra they're these two beings that in in some ways uh, are are kind of the logical outcome of victim perpetrator behavior but we are we're all holding a sense of victimhood and we're all holding a sense of entitlement at the same time and really seeing how victimhood plays out especially in you know spaces where i operate which is uh, leftist political circles and anarchist groups and activist groups the sense of victimhood is so strong right and this belief in something is happening to me you know rather than something is happening through me which is a more kind of mystical non-linear way to see the world and then the thought form of entitlement although we we predominantly see it in people with privilege and dominator class etc it's it's in all of us as well and so i think part of the practice of this moment in, in this sort of non-dualistic initiation is to really understand how entitlement and victimhood lives within our bodies at a somatic level how it's playing out in our relational field and really trying to track it and and see it and be a student of our culture and see how it plays out in that broader societal field. Mm, fascinating. I I can feel like these energies as you said like almost in deity form that like you can feel how they're traveling around <laughs> around and through us. And even just the notion of, of the pandemic, you know, I've been in the UK this whole past year. There's a lot of noise about how inconvenient it is, you know, to be locked down, to be forced to stay at home and watch Netflix and <laughs> order things online and whatever else, you know, is a kind of the ways that people are passing time. That in itself is such an enormous luxury that many people around the world are not having with this pandemic. I'm curious as to what's happening in the Amazon at this time, both in terms of the hugely reported levels of COVID and also the lack of tourism and other kind of ways of economy are having in terms of yeah the the kind of economic politics yeah you know i'm i'm not an expert on the amazon but i have been um in solidarity with uh, various indigenous groups in the amazon for for a number of years now and i also for for many years uh, have been working in a in various amazonian uh, shamanic traditions and and have teachers that come through our community and so i i i know enough maybe let's say uh but i'm definitely not an expert but what's happening i always like to to step back and look at the the, the historical sort of precedents that like got us to this moment right and what's playing out now is the the logical outcome and consequences of the the violence of of colonialism and the violence of of late stage capitalism what they have done is led to this sort of globalized high very unresilient system right that has put the entire world in a dependency on a globalized supply chain of extraction and so you know we used to have as a as a species many ways to acquire goods and services right fishing and farming and bartering and trading and hunting and gathering all of these things and uh, as the commons were enclosed and as uh, the interests of uh, private capital were imposed around the world through you know quote unquote development we're we're now in a state where everyone is dependent on debt based currency we've indebted the the nations of the global south and and obviously all the amazonian nations they they have no no i wouldn't say no but the the primary means now of acquiring goods and services is largely you know us backed debt based capital or or ac currency that is linked to that and so we've sort of gutted traditional systems through the globalized industrial capitalist system and also indigenous people are 
more susceptible we're finding to uh, zoonotic viruses like COVID. You know, we know the, the historical through line on this, right? That, for example, in, in Latin America, about 90% of the population of the continent from the 1500s to the 1700s was decimated, not just by the, the genocide of, of the Portuguese and the Spanish, but through the bubonic plague, through black plague, etc., that was brought. And, you know, there's a lot of scholarly research on this, that, that because of the domestication of certain animals in Europe that were new to the Latin American continent, the Europeans had uh, acquired a resistance to these viruses. And so that we're seeing, you know, that, that old line, uh, you know, first tragedy and then farce, right? It's like we're getting to that stage where now history is re replaying itself. And so the question of like, why does COVID exist you know, this is not like some kind of inconvenient blip on the arrow of progress going upwards forever. The outcome of in, infringing on the, the natural world. Lots of scientists from various fields have come out and said, we're going to just see a larger and larger increase in zoonotic viruses like COVID as we infringe on the natural world. And this is the consequence of our way of living. And so I think that's also the context to put this in. Like, of course, communities in the Amazon are being hit disproportionately hard. They're um, physically dying at higher levels. Wisdom is being lost. Elders are being lost. Language and traditions are being lost. And they're economically also disproportionately being hurt. And these are not unrelated to the way we live in the West. Quite the opposite. This is the direct result of the, the Western way of living that has now become the globalized way of living, which is itself inherently destructive because it has a growth based a perpetual growth based prime directive at its root so that context really widens the lens of understanding this time and within it it gives a, a different way of seeing entitlement and victimhood as you relate it back to the west and so i'm curious as to yeah, in your studies and experiences, what practices or ways of being you have experienced or discovered that have helped you to understand more deeply these concepts of entitlement and victimhood? Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a, a personal journey, right? And I, I'm not a person to say these are ways or pathways to do this work, but what I can say is from my my personal practice uh, over the years, like I grew up in a I grew up in a Sufi tradition, and so I grew up spending a lot of time in contemplation and prayer with my family, with my extended family. This is sort of what we did, and I think also infused with the fact that my both my parents are East African immigrants who moved to Canada, very different migrational roots. They come from a, a similar spiritual impulse. They always had an internationalist, cosmopolitan lens because they were displaced peoples, and so there was a certain, you know, diaspora consciousness merged with a with a certain sort of mystical tradition, and and that definitely informed my early understanding of of the fact that spiritual work and political work are not separate. And so, as I finished university and and moved into political space, first as a political consultant and and strategist and policy person, and then later as, a, as an activist and organizer. And then I moved into sort of narrative intervention work with various social movements. I started to realize that actually the, the, the application of my spiritual work in political context was, was an accelerator. This old idea that, well, I'm going to spend my time in, in sort of spiritual practice and achieve spiritual enlightenment, and then I will be useful to the community, right? The, the idea of like, well, you just have to do your inner work. I find deeply problematic. I think this is like a, a false dualism, a false binary that is preventing spiritual communities from actually engaging with what's happening in the world. And what I've found is the more I'm in solidarity with, with other communities, with marginalized peoples, with people who are uh, facing, you know, structural violence from the existing system that I started more deeply see the entanglement of how the, the dominant culture of our time, which I, I was socialized in being, you know, born and raised in, in Canada and, and living in, in London for many years and then New York for many years and then South Africa and, and now in Costa Rica, 
uh, and I see sort of my role in that more and more, right? And I also see that solidarity is not a political concept. It's not something that just activists do. It's an active embodied spiritual practice. It's also a pathway to spiritual development. My sort of understanding of the entanglement of these things and, and the, the sort of constellational worldview of how all of these things are connected from the, the way I consume to where my food comes from, where my energy comes from, where my water comes from, you know, how I am with other people, how patriarchy plays out in my day-to-day interactions or how racial hierarchy plays out in my day-to-day interactions is so deeply interconnected within the culture in which we live. The, the way I see this is like being a good student of our culture and really understanding the impoverishments of the culture in which we were born and socialized, which for many of us is the dominant culture of the West, of industrialized capitalism, is part of the spiritual practice. You know, there's that old Buddhist line, which is um, enlightenment doesn't happen in the cave, it happens in the mouth of the lion. And capitalism is the mouth of the lion. And so when you see these interactions between these things, and then you're in the grocery store and you realize like, oh, I'm getting asparagus in London in December, that there is implications to that. Like that, that's when I think a, a sort of a, a deeper understanding and a deeper spiritual practice can be gleaned and accessed. Mm, that's so powerful. And it does feel like this is a time where spirituality and politics really are coming together. And I know in my own experience that it's through my spiritual practice that I find the resilience to keep showing up to stay in my body to keep exploring new ways to contribute and to be able to handle the uncertainty of what might be coming Mm -hmm. totally and and i think part of that spiritual practice as well for me is like contemplation on what's happening outside of my body as well what what's happening in the external world is a a larger fractal of my my micro fractal of my body these things are not separate. And so the the deeper my contemplation in the interlinking between these two things, like what's happening in my body, what's happening in my immediate environment, what's happening in my community, what's happening at the global level, what's happening in my web of relations with other people, and how are these thought forms playing themselves out? If I could see that victimhood and entitlement are playing themselves out on this bigger stage, they're also playing themselves out in my body. And so part of my, my deprogramming work and, and my decolonization work, which I see as spiritual work and spiritual practice, is to understand, like, why do I feel entitled to X or Y or Z? There's a Sufi proverb attributed to the great mother, and she says to her children, you are entrusted with everything and entitled to nothing. You are entrusted with everything and entitled to nothing. So you're given this bounty of life this uh, relational web of beings from your family to your ancestral DNA to your cosmic spiritual ancestry to uh, you know every being you interact with and the elements. And all of these are endowments and you have to treat them as such. And there's nothing that you're actually entitled to or that you deserve, right? And if that's your starting point, if that's your like baseline logic of how you enter space and you enter the world, and you enter circle with other human beings, then as soon as I feel entitled to something, it's my responsibility to go back and deprogram myself and understand where that entitlement comes from. In Western culture, that entitlement is so strong, right? Because we, we're taught to believe, uh, you know, we're entitled to money and then money allows you to be entitled to anything you want, right? Whoever has money has access, right? And all of these old sort of tropes without ever thinking about the consequences of where that money came from, how it was born, the extraction and dispossession and the blood that was required to acquire that money and then what you're acquiring with that money. And you know, that whole that whole thing that comes with the sort of like culture of quote unquote, you know, the market, right? Or or more accurately like market fundamentalism. The interaction of all of these things just happening that that seem like they're just, you know, the way things are, are deeply influencing, you know, our neural nets, right? And our relational web. And they're so deeply intermeshed that it actually does require contemplation and time and space to sit back and say, these things are not outside of me. And if they're not outside of me, then I am 
responsible and I have co-agency in this creation. That's powerful and it invites us in so much deeper than a ready-made solution or conscious capitalism, you know, or kind of like a, a, a band-aid kind of approach. Yeah, exactly. Because because if we don't have a structural analysis of what's happening, we're going to come up with these ideas like social capitalism that, that make us feel better temporarily because they're, they're salves for the ego. And that's not to say we shouldn't engage in a more conscious capitalism. Like, of course, if you have a choice between hardcore Goldman Sachs psychotic extraction and a, a, a more compassionate form of capitalism, well, engage in the more compassionate form of capitalism. But let's not pretend that's the solution to the structural problems we're facing. I find that for most people, it's quite hard to fully embrace and understand the structural issues that we're facing to be able to find a way to show up whilst also homeschooling kids or putting food on the table and paying mortgages and all of those other aspects that life in the system can, well, it needs in order to to keep it ticking. How do you feel that we can begin a process of that or deepen our process? Like, is it through developing contemplation as a practice? I come from um, a mystical spiritual tradition and I come from an anarchist political tradition. And so, and in and, and both of those traditions, there's a lot of overlap. There's the belief that our aim is sort of Gnostic, right? It's to have a direct relationship with wisdom or the divine or what have you. And so there, there's sort of infinite paths into this. I would say that contemplation is definitely a, a sort of critical path and not just contemplation about spiritual aspects of our lives, but contemplation about erotic aspects of our lives, about political aspects of our lives. I'd also say it's solidarity as a spiritual practice, putting yourself in the, in the messiness of other people's needs and uh, desire for self-governance and sovereignty, etc., is really a part of that. We've been taught that to be a citizen means that you vote every four years or what have you. And, and actually uh, creating new kinds of relationships and interactions and uh, being involved in like uh, direct democracy processes, for example, citizens assemblies, working with your local Extinction Rebellion group or Occupy groups or, or, or what have you. Th this is part of that practice. There's a famous German anarchist from, from the 19th century who said, the state is a condition, a certain relationship between human beings, a mode of behavior. We destroy it by contracting other relationships, by behaving differently toward one another. This is Gustav Landaway. I'd say just the, the very practice of living the post-capitalist values is itself an act, but that requires being a good student of your culture and spending some time educating yourself, ourselves, on what's happening in the world as like an ongoing praxis. It's not just like a one-time thing you do. It's like, we spend all of this time reading self-help books and doing spiritual development and being in our online Zoom meditation classes, whatever. But we don't really spend that time figuring out how the economic system works or the political system works and how it affects us. And, and part of the reason is that the dominant culture and establishment power elites, for example, try to obfuscate and make that realm seem really complicated, right? And it, it's actually not complicated in some ways. Like, a, a, a simple way to, to see this, the, the market system is just a complex, adaptive, evolutionary system. It's alive, right? So when, when you understand that, like, our operating system is just a set of rules that are uh, man-made that then create, like, a generative set of outcomes, right? So you invent something like compound interest, and then whoever has capital ends up getting exponential capital, and whoever has debt in that system ends up being in exponential debt. And, and these are just rules that have calcified you know, into, we almost think that they're laws of nature now. And so by, by understanding that the system is, in some ways, it's like the greatest artificial intelligence humans have ever created and maybe ever will, right? All, all these Silicon Valley people are waiting for the singularity 
the time where computers take over human intelligence. And it's like singularities are already here and it's, it's late stage capitalism. And so when you understand that, then you start to think, well, it's, it's actually incumbent on me as a citizen of, of troubled times to understand the nature of this oxygen. And, and I think just that desire to do that, just that willingness, just that shift opens up the possibility for that contemplation, for that solidarity, for those practices to happen. As soon as we say politics is not something I'm interested in, or that's something beyond me or whatever, then what we're actually doing is we're abdicating our responsibility. We're in support of the status quo. And so that willingness is just really the, in some ways, the prerequisite for that opening to happen. Because you, you are in dialogue with an animate living planet. And as soon as you put your intention into that animate field and you say, I have a desire to better understand the impoverishment of my culture and how it's affecting the suffering of humanity and the more than human world, then answers will be given to you because you're opening up that space for dialogue. That's very powerful. It's a way of embracing the political in a way that doesn't get us completely bogged down in the theatrics of current politics. Because something that I feel happens when people want to engage more in a political understanding of this world, that they go into the mainstream politics, which is, you know, partisan and them versus us and who's right. And then they can get really bogged down and turned off. I love that what you offered there is a way of understanding our political system in relation to the whole. Yeah, I I personally find electoral politics really boring and, and ridiculous, right? It's like a form of pantomime. I see politics more in the sense of like political philosophy and moral philosophy. Who has power? Why do they have power? Who gets to decide? Who's being immiserated by the system? How do I be in, in service to them and into service to 200 species a day that are going extinct because our way of living or the oceans that are being acidified? And almost in some ways replacing the word politics with the word power and understanding that like being in contemplation of how power affects every aspect of our lives is our responsibility as, as spiritual beings and human beings incarnated on the planet right now. It's, it's also like sometimes I use the word they or power elites or one percenters, et cetera, but it, it is non-dualistic, right? I don't see them as outside of me. There's a one percenter that lives within all of us. There's a Trump that lives within all of us. And simultaneously, there are those who are benefiting from the existing system disproportionately and who are actively creating conditions and contexts that are increasing suffering for other beings. And that is not acceptable. But what we find often is like, especially among spiritual communities and new age communities, that there's this fear of judgment. The the way I see it is actually this fear of judgment or the fear of duality, for example, because there's this belief that we are all one, but, and we are all one and we are in physically separate incarnations for now. And that matters that has material implications on our experience. If you are a black man or woman in the empire of the United States, you're having a very different physical experience and having just a you know, play on the stereotype, but to have like a, a, a white yoga teacher from California say, well, we're all one and I don't want to engage in the, the messiness of this judgment and duality and who am I to judge and who are you to judge it is, is actually supporting that existing system, right? As Howard Zinn used to say, you can't be neutral on a moving train. The question is, how do we get to this non-dualistic state as a contemplation where I know there's a one percenter in me? I know that there's this thought form of entitlement that I have, not just entitlement, entitlement, privilege, the belief of uh, superiority on some level that I've given physical real estate in my body and in my neural net. And at the same time, know that there are those who are actively working to keep this existing system in place. Those two things are true simultaneously. So I can say there is a one percenter or Donald Trump did X or Netanyahu did Y or whatever. And both of those things are true at the same time. And and this is why I say like we're being initiated into non-dualistic thought. 
because we have to be able to hold both of those perspectives so we could both deepen our spiritual work and our spiritual practice because you know none of us are free until all of us are going are all of us are free right as the as the old abolitionist statement goes it's that's spiritually true as well we're just going to have to keep reincarnating over and over till we create a context and a structure in which all beings can be liberated and that collective liberation is the goal of our spiritual work these things are not separate and the deeper we go into this work and the deeper we go into this practice and the deeper we go into our seva and our service for for the the living planet and the living cosmos the more the the entelechy of the human soul can be fulfilled hello we're taking a short pause from the conversation on behalf of our team and our community thank you for being here and co-creating the future is beautiful much dedication love and time goes into the production of this show we believe in being advertising free in a world that's always trying to sell us stuff we don't need and so we make this show with you and for you thanks to your support there are three ways you can be more involved so we can share the vision wisdom and creativity here as we explore what it means to be a human in this time you can support the podcast by sharing it with your friends posting episodes on social media and doing itunes reviews you can support as a patron by making a monthly or one off donation of your choice and with this you join the global patrons group and monthly video calls where we share connection and insight you get to know the other amazing patrons from around the world their stories and their work and you offer direct support to me and the team as well as being brought into the behind the scenes of creating something like this it sounds like a lot but it's as much or as little as you want to get involved in you can become a member of presence our membership collective of care and practice where we explore how to embody the themes of the podcast with workshops calls special events tree whispers and powerful tools practices and rituals that you can bring into your life this is open to absolutely everybody as we create an inclusive and diverse space that celebrates well-being as a human right where we explore together what it means to be creative, courageous and connected to ourselves, each other and the earth. This is about embodying sacred activism. We love meeting patrons and presence members and how being part in this way weaves our lives together as well as making the show possible. If anything from this conversation has moved or inspired you, please get more involved. All information can be found at www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash community this show really can't go on without your patronage and presence membership so please do make it happen and now back to the conversation we're at this moment where as you said at the beginning there is so much duality even though the invitation is to come into a space of of non-dual and an embrace that there are these different aspects and yet at this time there are so many different world views that are really creating a lot of polarization it's interesting how it's affecting those in the spiritual community one being the the new optimist narrative which says that everything's actually going great on the planet right now and and things are a lot better than they ever have been and then we have the the doom narrative that you know everything it's all over and there's nothing we can do about it and then this kind of complex thing that's really happened come alive in the spiritual community through this election cycle around various theories and who might be the savior and what great awakenings might be happening and whether the vaccine's safe whether covid's real all of this kind of thing and i find so many people at this time are feeling quite confused and exhausted by all these different rabbit holes that they can go down on that quest for truth and so i'm curious as to how for somebody that doesn't feel very grounded in their perspective at this time that is opening up to contemplation around 
the politics in which we're in and maybe being pulled into one of these rabbit holes that makes actually just being here right now much more difficult than it perhaps needs to be or much more numb than it perhaps needs to be. What you can offer to ground back. Yeah, there's um, a political adage that is often attributed to, um, attributed to Antonio Gramsci. Uh, and it says, we are prisoners of context in the absence of meaning. We are prisoners of context in the absence of meaning. You know, part of our work then is to recontextualize our current moment and what's happening. And, and all of us have to do that work. And, and it also means that we have to re-sacralize meaning in some way. And, and so maybe I say something about both. So for, in terms of context, what's helpful for me to understand is, is these sort of broader cycles, right? So, you know, in the Indian tradition, in the Vedic tradition, they'd say we're in the Kali Yuga right now, right? That's the, the belief that we're in the midst of the dark ages. We're in the world where everything is topsy-turvy, where the psychopathic get rewarded, uh, and are seen as titans of industry or, you know, become presidents and prime ministers, et cetera. In the, so, so, you know, in the, in the Buddhist tradition, they call this, the, the, this period, the, the great degeneration in various other, you know, first nations prophecies from, from Turtle Island. You know, this is the, the time of the, the seventh fire where we human beings have a choice to continue on this path or, or go the other way. And I, I think just even coming to grips with, with that, is, is, is actually very helpful. And this also goes back to entitlement to a certain extent, right? This belief that things should be a certain way is an expectation that is setting us up for disappointment. People should tell the truth and there should be justice. And, you know, all of these kind of expectations we smuggle in to our sense-making of the world. Actually, just by removing them and saying, no, we are in the dark ages, the people who get reward in the get rewarded in this complex adaptive system that we talked about are the people who best serve the logic of the system. Well, what's the logic of the system? It's short-termist, it's psychotic, it's greedy, it's life-denying. Instead of looking at people who are on the cover of Fortune magazine or the New York Times or whatever as people you admire or aspire to, uh, you you just see them as the the servants, the best servants of the logic of late stage capitalism, of the logic of extraction and commodification and destruction. And so that helps contextualize and situate where you want to be in the current culture in which you find yourself. And it also allows us to be better at disidentifying with the dominant system. In order to be in the sense making, on one level, you have to, you, you have to disidentify from, from that system. To understand power, you have to understand the culture, but in order to decode the culture, you have to develop critical faculties, which you could either see as a burden or a privilege. What a beautiful opportunity to, to better understand the oxygen in which you breathe. And then to be critical of that oxygen, you have to disidentify with the object of critique, which in this case is the dominant culture. And so... I, the, the first part of this, you know, Gramsci's equation, where prisoners of context and the absence of meaning, is to recontextualize by looking at these wisdom traditions and situating ourselves in that, and then disidentifying from this dominant culture, which which will do anything it can to make us identify with it, right? From making us wealthy and embedded within that system, or using tricks like nationalism and patriotism or identification with your job or your nation state or telling you everything you have is because of your social location or because you were born in the United States or whatever, right? Th these are all seductive techniques that a complex adaptive system uses to keep you embedded and identified. So part of our practice is to disidentify and recontextualize. And, you know, there's lots of ways to do that. And we've talked about a few of them, right? The practice of solidarity, contemplation, spiritual practices, tantra, yoga, meditation, work with psychedelics in containers that respect the traditions that they come from and, you know, treat these plant medicines as, as sacred. Uh, so there, there's lots of ways into getting to these boundary dissolving states where 
you can transcend the idea of subject object uh, us versus them and and see our broader role in the context and then the second part of the equation in the absence of meaning is to re-sacralize meaning spending time to say to to think about what is the world i want to create and what are the values by which i live if i'm not going to be identified with the existing system and i actually want to be a conscientious objector of late stage capitalism i have to spend time myself on the questions of first principles what are my values where are we going as a civilization what is my purpose and for almost a whole period of modernity that this you know 5000 year anomaly in in human history where we went from you know hunter gatherers for 99% of human history to the, the sort of patriarchal extractive gendered hierarchy racialized hierarchy sort of capitalist system where wealth is equated with success and goodness and you know all of that then it's sort of incumbent on us to to spend time reflecting on what our first principles are often what's happened is we've we've given that responsibility over to religion for a, a long period of time right and or or to science and rationalism right the, the 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 belief in progress as an arrow so we don't really have to do anything because uh, you know we're the apex species and this apex species is in this like ever uh, upward uh, directionality towards uh, utopia, right? Because th- these are the, the programs we're given. We ourselves have to relocate meaning in the way we live our lives. It's not going to be given to us through religions or institutions of power or anything else. Th- that's a very powerful moment. And it's a very powerful initiation moment for us in a broken culture. And so it, th- this is, a, um, in, in some ways, not a direct answer to what do you do in the post-truth world and who do you believe and what's there to believe. But I'd say like the reason we're having this conspirituality phenomena and a lot of people in the spiritual community believing in QAnon and Trump as Messiah and other things is because we don't really understand the context in which we're in and we've given our meaning-making power over to religious institutions ideas such as progress and purpose and enlightenment and ascension and all of these narratives and all of these thought forms and deities that are outside of us. And part of that practice now is to understand our role as consciousness becoming self-aware, you know, as co-gods and co-creators of a reality that we have to both take responsibility for historically and also have a responsibility for in the, the creation of what's coming next. Thank you. I feel like that's all very helpful and and really does actually offer the grounding. And it invites us to reshape our own relationship with power, where we source the, the power that runs through our body, then impacts what we think and, and what we do and what we feel. When I started this project, the future is beautiful in 2010 it started off with this question what is the future you choose you know what is the world that you want to live in it came from this perspective that the systems that we have don't work and so if we can connect deeper to our values and what it is that we do want to have in this world that there is a, a chance of creating it and, and that it gives us some orientation for our lives. And as you were speaking, I feel like I, I understood the importance of our values in a whole different way. Any process where we see the problems with the authority in which we've known, and we really take on a process of deprogramming and deconditioning from that being just the way it is or just what we have to do or just how we have to live, that process is going to be difficult and messy. I feel like that's some of what can stop some of us from from going forth in it. I always remember Jyoti, who you might know, saying the endings falling into the beginning, this notion that as 
a new paradigm is possible, old paradigms have to die and we have to detach ourselves from them. And it's very difficult to be both a servant of a system and also be detaching and creating another one. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I I love that line, the ending is falling into the beginning. And this is why I say, you know, part of our spiritual practice is to be conscientious objectors of of late stage capitalism. Because by by being implicated in this life-destroying system, we are actually preventing our spiritual development. Because if anyone was to do the work of what their uh, personal values are and what world they want to build, it would not be the existing world, right? It would not be eating meat from slaughterhouses and having uh, plastic put into the ocean every time they uh, open up the package for something or actively contribute to the destruction of the global south and mining mineral resource extraction uh, every time they pick up their phone. Like that's not the world we would want to create. It, you know, it also reminds me of, you know, in Tantra, the, the idea of like mantra and mudra. When you look at like the ancient text, like mantra is not just a saying. It's not just like soham or, or something like that or ya Allah. You know, mantra is, is more akin to entelechy. What is the, the world you want to see through the interaction of you with the world? And mudra is not just like, you know, putting your hands in prayer or symbols, but mudra is the physical embodiment of your mantra. It's like your, your entire body is your mudra, right? Your entire sort of energetic field is your mudra because it's expressing your prayer. You know, when I think about what are the post-capitalist realities, what do they look like, right? I, I don't see like an ism, you know, I don't think the role of post-capitalism is to replace socialism or communism or capitalism. It's more of like a, a container for ideas that transcend traditional structures of ownership, growth, accumulation, destruction. And, and it's based on shared values. And I think the more the spiritual community or political communities and others start to say, here's the values in which I stand. And here are examples of how generosity, altruism, interdependence, you know, nonviolence, empathy, compassion, solidarity with all life. Here's how they play out in concepts such as universal basic income or co-op ownership models or commons-based governance or even self-selecting to be sort of taxed in a certain way, right? Or building communities and experiments outside that existing system. And so we can create contexts in which we are food sovereign, which we're not dependent on this existing system. That does require practice and it requires sacrifice to a certain extent. And this is how we come back full circle to the idea of entitlement, right? Because our entitlement and and the belief that we should have food whenever we want from the local grocery store without doing any work for that or any sort of energetic exchange or request for permission from the land, this is how it's playing out. Being explicit to the living animate planet on what your values are then creates the, the potentiality and the multiple streams of possibility that will allow you to enact that mantra and that mudra. Mm, I love that. I am a deep practitioner of both mantra and mudra. What I love about them is that they bring into form that which I want to bring into this earth, that it allows me to connect to qualities that I know exist within myself. You know, they become like the dominant culture, if you like, in my body and in my energy field. Yeah, completely. And, you know, we, we, we are highly contextual beings. You know, this is, this is basically what 30 years of social science has, has shown us, right? You put people in, the, in a certain context, like the Stanley Milgram experiments, and most people will, will shock people to the point of death. You know, just because someone in a white lab coat told them to, you know, we were hunter gatherers, as as we said earlier, for for ninety nine percent of human history, and in that context, we were highly altruistic and cooperative, and you know, we know from like bone uh, density sample and teeth samples, we were having like two thousand calories a day and working ten hours a week, and and so the context in which we are doing this work is so critical, and so the reason 
the political economic structures are deeply interlinked and interwoven with our spiritual work is that unless we have context that allows and helps and supports and cultivates spiritual development for the entire planet, both human and more than human, unless that context is created, our ability for our soul's work to be done is greatly diminished. And, and, and again, it's not just about individual enlightenment. This has to be done at a collective level, and that requires a new context, and that context requires new stories. So the, these old ideas we've been told that you know, human beings are inherently selfish, and nature is red in tooth and claw, you know, the, the Hobbesian idea, and the idea of like competition being the, the, the sort of root of societal interaction, right? And we get like Adam Smith's invisible hand. If everyone's just selfish, some perfect equilibrium will be created. We know all of those things are now, all those belief systems are, are completely, they're false gods. Just in the social science realm, we know human beings are highly contextual. In cultural anthropology, we've been learning about the original affluent society and how, how human beings function outside of, of extractive sedentary lifestyles. Now this is the crossroads we're at, this ability to create ancient futures. You know, we're not trying to go back to some paleolithic idyllic past, but we want to take the, we want to synthesize the best aspects of what we know, how our deep time ancestors lived and, and merge that with, with Western technique and sort of innovations that we, we've, we've had in the last 500 years. And part of that equation is that we want to remove the psychosis of colonization and hierarchy and domination and extraction that led us to this point. And so there's no point to fighting for the perpetuation of capitalism. That, 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 that doesn't make any sense. We, we know that that train has run out of steam, but, and we're also not trying to create, recreate some distant past. Something else is being asked of us. Something new wants to, new and ancient, let's say, is emerging and wants to be born. And I think the question for us is, how do we best serve that? And how do we, in, with the deepest humility, ask the, the living animate planet through our prayer and through our daily practice and through our embodiment and through mantra and mudra, how we could be in deepest service to that unfolding? The last of the Sufi proverbs for the day, but the, the old Sufi proverb is that humility is the aphrodisiac of the gods. Yeah, I, I feel that. I feel that humility is what makes everything possible. When I feel in myself through my practice that connection to a more powerful energy, that coming to it with humility and a really deep contemplation of service and where this power can be directed really helps to ground the experience. Otherwise, it's so easy to get taken by one of these, I guess, demons of the time, you know? I'm in like the Instagram culture and, you know, that's something that I'm part of. I'm in the world of having to make a living from work that I would love to just do and give to the world. It requires a very delicate and gentle balance to stay in that place where the, the deepening of service and what's possible is alive and one doesn't get kind of pulled into the, you know, the misuses of power for want of a better way of explaining it. It feels like it's always a tightrope. Yeah. And one of the means by which the dominant system controls us is through this idea of consistency. You know, better to be a Goldman Sachs banker who's sort of knows their values and is just a pure, you know, extraction destruction machine than to be somebody who's trying to be in service and has to deal with the messiness and the contradiction of, of, of living in a you know totalitarian globalized market economy. And you know, there's that old Ralph Waldo Emerson line where he says, a, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. 
right? And it's like consistency is not the goal. It's practice, right? We're all entangled in neoliberal capitalism. Our clothes are probably made in sweatshops. You know, I live on a regenerative organic farm that has, you know, uses, our truck uses fossil fuels, right? And we take airplanes to get here. We are all entangled in that messiness and that inconsistency. And that's okay, because that's what it is to be a transition being in the Kali Yuga. And part of our practice is how do we be more and more aware of the entanglements so we can be in deeper and deeper service to post-capitalist futures and we can remove the aspects of our lives that aren't consistent with our values. Yeah, I love how you put that, that embrace of the messiness and the entanglements, but with awareness. And without shame, because it feels like shame gets in the way because of the the desire that many that are spiritual or political in the sense that we're discussing, leaning, have a desire to do the right thing, um, whatever that whatever that means. And because of that, there can be a lot of shame around managing oneself within a flawed system. And I find that that shame, I've witnessed it kind of get in the way of a deeper sense of of connection. Yeah. And this is also related to both the ideas of like self-responsibility and deciding like what is enough and what are we willing to give up? You know, what is abundance, right? And especially in spiritual communities, this idea of abundance, I find it, it, it can often be this very sort of dangerous double-edged sword. And there's a, a line that's come to me a few times, which is abundance is not the manifestation of physical wealth. It is the absence of scarcity from the heart. So abundance is not the manifestation of physical wealth. It's the absence of scarcity from the heart. So the aim of even the idea of abundance and manifestation that have been sort of co-opted by the new age is not to have more within the capitalist system, right? It's, it's to remove the scarcity that we have inherited as people born into this dying culture of globalized Western capitalism. And the more we remove the scarcity from our heart, the more in trust we will be of the universe and the planet, and the more and the less we will need, and the more in touch we will be with with our context and those around us. And that relational web of beingness, not just with human beings, but with all beings, seen and unseen, deepens. That's abundance. When you're in that relational field, you know, we know this from people doing deep spiritual practices and how little they need in terms of food, shelter, comfort, etc. When that relational web carries you, that is when you're in a state of abundance. It's not having the comfortable house and the nice car. And, and actually, in some ways, like this is what's so dangerous about like the, the Tony Robbins culture and all of this. It's like, as soon as you are praying for those things, you're creating contracts and negotiating with deities and entities of like we have no idea the level of consciousness of those assisting beings there's something very powerful about reframing abundance as the removal of scarcity of the heart i love that i haven't heard that phrase before around abundance and it's it's really beautiful i often contextualize abundance as the abundant nature of our soul. So when we connect to to that, which is abundant ab- about us and that which has that has its own kind of path and journey that that we will always find what we need for that soul journey that we need to go on as our kind of piece in the puzzle. And that that's different from having everything that society, tells us we need to have. Yeah, it's like the Atman aspect, right? It's eternal, it's infinite. The word abundance is not even required in that state if you can access that state. Yeah, absolutely. And it's understanding that what it is you need to do your part can come to you easily. But when you're focusing on what you think you need, you know, due to entitlement or the the dominant culture ideals that is where we get this notion of scarcity 
how come they have that and I don't? Or like, how come I can't make that much money? Or how come I can't do that? You know, it's like we kind of get caught in these cycles and stories that take us further away from what's there for us if we're able to listen. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. I wanted to ask you just about about your new book and the research and what you've been learning and moving into as you've been doing you know so many conversations with different people in different realms and fields and then synthesizing it into your latest book. I'd love to hear some of your insights and lessons. Thank you for the question. Well, the the book is about intuition. It's a a book that's very like accessible for people that may not be on anything like a spiritual journey that are very heavily into a dominant culture could pick up this book and kind of find a way of unlocking a deeper intelligence within themselves. What's really interesting about intuition as I was feeling into what it was that I wanted to say and how I wanted to explain it is that the more that I felt into it and the more that I was feeling, I had to to develop nine principles of intuition. What came really clear for me is that the more that we cultivate a relationship with our intuition, and and I, I understand that to be an intelligence that lives in all of us and an intelligence that is connected, words like Akashic records or morphogenic fields or however we want to understand this interconnected web of information, that if we were to all reclaim our relationship with that part of our intelligence, it would break the system that we're in. Because we can't live fully connected to the truth of who we are on an individual, soul, personal level as well as the the truth of our interconnection and and to really be able to listen to each other and to the more than human world and still operate within the dominant system. I find that really interesting that, yeah, that this is a time where more and more people are, are making an inquiry into what that intelligence that we have might be. And so in this book, I I didn't really get to share kind of insights from from The Future is Beautiful and from all the conversations that we're having here. But I did share different ways of understanding how we're formed and how we can decondition ourselves and deprogram ourselves and how we can understand ourselves as interconnected beings and, you know, the practices, some of which we've talked about today, from contemplation to meditation, to yoga, to plant medicines, to spending more time in nature, these ways that that connect us deeper to who we actually are when we are not pawns within a capitalist system. Yeah, I feel really honored to have been able to explore that theme throughout 2020 and to have been writing that book whilst we've been called more inwards in terms of a collective initiation at this time. And also as much as we've been called inwards into a deeper connection to our own spiritual work, we've also been called outwards into being more clear on what's happening in our world and where we can be of service because there are many people that have been put into positions of deeper suffering. And so there's an inquiry that we can all be making at this time of even just in the very local vicinity to me, like, what is it that I, that I can do and where there is a need in my local community? In terms of the podcast and the conversations, I don't know in terms of sense-making, where I am or where we are as a community from all of these conversations. But I feel like every time we sit down and we engage in one of these conversations that we 
that we allow a deeper deconditioning and deprogramming to happen and that we allow more of that wisdom that lives inside of us to come alive. And so for me, each episode of this podcast feels very ceremonial in that way. We've been exploring, you know, the the difficult questions. We've been deep in understanding the systems of oppression, uh, as well as how to be more courageous and resilient in the challenges of now. You know, as you said at the beginning, that may really be just preparing us kind of gently for what might be to come. And, and to understand that not in a sense of like doom, but to understand that as, as something that's okay, you know? And those words, we were made for these times. Yeah, that's Clarissa Pinkola Estes, who wrote Women Who Run With The Wolves, wrote this beautiful poem, We Were Made For These Times. As we really understand that that is, that we incarnated here now, and that we have something to offer at this time, that it gives us that medicine that we need to become more embodied and become more present, to not be scared of what this time is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I I, I love um, Clarissa's, yeah, whatever it is, little essay, poem, prose. You know, it makes me think of two things. One is in some of the esoteric, Vedic texts, they, they talk about, yes, the Kali Yuga is the dark times of planet Earth, but it's also the times where we receive the most assistance from other beings and deities. Uh, and it's the time where the, the, the most light hits the Earth because it's required. And I also like what you said about really taking responsibility that we've chosen these incarnations at this time to be here at this moment for a reason. That is part of our, our entelechy to use the, the, the German term or, or mantra. And it also made me think about this, this connection between initiation and intuition and how the two are so intimately connected. I don't know if you, do you know the work of Francis Weller? Not very well, but I was reading uh, your interview that you sent me. Yeah, I'm a big fan of his, of his work. And he, he wrote this beautiful essay series called In the Absence of the Ordinary during COVID. And it's quite short. It's like a 60 page PDF, but he, he talks a lot about the difference between sort of initiation culture and, and trauma culture. They're, they're actually the same process in some ways, right? There's the severance from the world. And then you have this, you know, radical alteration of the identity and, and the sense like you can't go back to the world as it was. And, and then there's this integration of that, you know, almost like foreignness that you have after you've gone through the initiation or the trauma. But the difference is that initiation is uh, what he calls like a contained encounter with death. The community, the elders, the ancestors, ritual, it's containing you. When like a, a, a Dogon 14-year-old is, is buried for three days under dirt or a L- Lakota child is doing a four-day vision quest, the, the community has an altar built for them and they're in prayer and in support. And so you know that you're being held and you're also not doing that initiation for yourself. You're doing it for the greater good of the community to become someone who knows how to be close with death and uh, somebody who knows how to be close with suffering. So then you can be in deeper service. And when you don't have that, it's sort of what we have in in Western culture, right? Like think of uh, the coming of age practices of university students, like you know, it's hazing and drink more beer and, you know, that sort of like abusive culture. And it's almost that because they've never had a contained experience with suffering, they've never been initiated into suffering or into deathless death, that their their closest proximity to suffering is inflicting suffering on others. When you're in that state, you're not, you're not in tune with your intuition. And, and in, in some sense, like intuition and the refinement and cultivation of intuition and the removal of veils that allow you to access that that universal identity that we were talking about earlier, that place where intuition resides, the in, the eternal, the infinite aspect of our being, that only comes from from initiation. You have to be initiated into your ability to feel fully, to remove the the obstacles that uh, dominant culture has imposed on us in terms of thought forms and mind viruses and uh, beliefs and and how we should behave. 
and and what what is culture right culture is just a, a set of collectively held delusions that we agree to and so what a, an encounter with with contained death does is it dissolves you from those conditions temporarily so you can see clearly again so you can access your intuition again for me i feel very blessed that in my early 20s i had um, three death initiations that unfortunately weren't held in community in that way but they were accidents that i was part of that forced me into spiritual initiation and a deeper relationship with my intuition and literally kind of bumped me out of dominant culture there were three of them one at, at 19 one at 21 um, and one at 24 i feel that those events you know they were dramatic one was being on a bus in Bolivia where the driver fell asleep and we went 50 meters down the side of a mountain in the jungle and flipped on its side and then into a tree stump. So we didn't go further down and we somehow all survived and we had to kind of climb up through the mud in the middle of the night up onto the road. And the second one being literally driven over by a four wheel drive pickup truck in Honduras by a man that was so intoxicated, he didn't even realize that he'd hit me, let alone that he was driving over me. The third one being a hit and run when my friend um, was killed in front of me as we were crossing the road back to her apartment in New York City. Through those experiences, it really opened up these big questions around spirituality and politics and and how to really be of service and how to listen deeper than what I was being shown. And when I feel into, you know, at the age of 19, there was a lot about me that was (laughs) extremely victimized and entitled. I had aspirations of, you know, the nice shoes and the handbag and the job and the lots of, you know, the dinners and and all of that kind of thing. And every time I went through one of these experiences, on just the most basic level, it altered what was important to me. And then there were so many levels to it, um, including having to to really face death head on in, in each one, to having to open up to support from the more than human world to go on an experience that was outside of my community. That's where I wish so much that we had ways in our culture to really honor and mark the transitions as we grow up. I was just actually invited today to do some work with teenagers and people in their early 20s. I had a big yes, like, please, I would love to offer like spiritual support to people at that age because it's so missing in our culture. And it does mean that we, we get this, this kind of false notion of, of coolness and it takes us so far away from the warmth of our hearts and the warmth of our blood pumping in these sacred bodies that we have good good yeah no i i i completely agree and yeah and one way to i wouldn't even say end maybe uh begin the ending uh because i know uh, as two people of of who have indian descent and that culture our our ending will be uh, a prolonged affair to start that process you you reminded me of one of my favorite poems by by rabia it's actually one of the only poems I, I have memorized because my my memory for these things is not very good, but it goes um, ironic, but one of the most intimate acts of our body is death. So beautiful appeared my death, knowing who then I would kiss. I died a thousand times before I died. Die before you die, said Prophet Muhammad. Have wings that feared ever touched the sun. I was born when all I once feared I could love. Mm, that's so beautiful. I feel very grateful of the death that I have been on this past year. 
you know, it feels like at the beginning of February, I came back to England to see my parents for a few weeks and I haven't left. One of my parents has left the world um, in physical form. Through this pandemic, there has been a process where at some point, and I don't even remember when it was, I let go of any notion of, you know, what I what it was I was returning to at whatever point. It feels like this real kind of hollowing out, a deeper invitation into presence. And through that, I feel really in this space of, of deep openness to, to what might emerge without any kind of hope or expectation. It's also been my first winter in a long time because I'm, I'm used to spending time in the winter in India. It's been really interesting. I'm, I'm by the sea. I feel very connected to the land and the elements. Between the winter solstice and Imbolc, I just haven't had any energy. It's like the that call to really go inwards and to to be reformed has taken over my body. And I find it so beautiful that I'm allowing that inconsistency. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I, I agree and I, I feel the same way. It's like, um, however we want to see this, you know, the winter of the global north or the Western way of living, the dark night of the soul that we're collectively going through, it's like death, you know, encountering the deity of death. These are all the way life it has space. You know, the, it, that's what's creating the space for life to continue. And whether that's on an individual reincarnation, rebirth, death, rebirth cycle, or, or collectively. Um, and so beautiful that you're embracing it in that way. And, and I think, yeah, that is, that is also part of the practice of, of surrender. And, and gives sort of the idea of surrender more finality, which is why it has more power. Beautiful. Al Noor, it's been such a pleasure to be in this space with you and to, to hear you. And with the added effect of not being able to hear all of the words <laughs> through, the, through the technology, and so being invited into a deeper space of energetic listening. <laughs> Yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah, and to be continued, we will hopefully, inshallah, the next time be in 3D in person. Thank you for, for your work and for bringing this community together and, and all the work you're doing and, and bridging the, I guess, perceived gap between the spiritual realm and the political realm. Thank you for yours and the very clear articulation that you have formed that makes it easier for everyone to navigate themselves within. How can people connect deeper to you if they feel called and find out more about what you're up to? We'll post links to everything, but it's really nice for people to hear it. I'm a pretty uh, private person in many ways. And, uh, you know, I, I used to like abhor uh, <laughs> public speaking of any kind. And I, I feel like, you know, even part of the reason I, I, I don't write books you know, because that then all of a sudden, you know, you have to be a person that's like promoting a book or whatever. And so I, I, all my essays are, are free, online, accessible, and I occasionally do podcasts like this, but um, I don't have a website. A lot of my political work right now is, is uh, in support and with uh, Culture Hack Labs. So you could check out their site and it's culturehack.io. And uh, a lot of the case studies of the work we've done for the last eight or 10 years through the rules uh, is on at therules.org. If someone says, you know, what, what is the, the a way somebody can support the work you're doing? Uh, I would just say like, uh, you know, holding that, that prayer field and uh, understanding our entanglement or, you know, even acknowledging that nothing I say is mine, right? Or these are not my ideas, nor do I want to benefit from them, right? It's just like seeing the other as an aspect of you, I think is in some ways the highest compliment. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Until next time. Until next time. Lots of love, my dear. Be well. We will talk soon. Lots of love. You too. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book, and discover so much more over on the blog, 
We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast. And so it's made possible with you, our community. If you loved this and would like to fund our show with a monthly donation or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community and support. Please also share with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so we can grow. Those gold stars really help others find us so these ideas can spread. Here is to us creating a beautiful future together. The Future is Beautiful is made by an all-female team working voluntarily or on reduced rates until our listener support grows. If you have been moved by anything you heard here, please donate the equivalent of buying us a drink. All donations make a huge difference to us and will allow us to keep doing this and remain advertising free. Until next time, I leave you with this question. How will you create beauty in the world?